Yeah, you get sympathy. <laughs> Man in the gray flannel beret. In the early 70s, I was a stoned-out hippie working at a bookstore on Lower East Side of Manhattan. Yes. I had long hair, a peace sign dangling from a leather lanyard around my neck, and a dog-eared copy of Howl in my back pocket. Luckily for me, the bookstore job was pretty low-key. Sometimes, on really slow nights, we closed the cash register in our poetry readings. One warm summer evening, Allen Ginsberg read there. After the reading, Ginsberg invited us to accompany him to a bar for some beers. Man, I got so excited. I was finally going to hear firsthand those rumored stories about wild fucking and freight cars, drug-crazed nights in exotic Mexican jungles, and gay hustling on the 402 deuce. I lit a joint I eagerly followed the poet across the street to the center pub. But the conversation didn't go at all the way I thought it would. Ginsburg proceeded to minutely detail for our enjoyment his book and record deals. How many tenths of a cent he got per copy of Howl's Soul. The only interesting moment occurred when Ginsburg interrupted himself to shout, Who the fuck is Maynard G. Krebs anyway? <laughs> I got thoroughly drunk and left, disappointed but still loving my beat up copy of Howl. Alan had signed it and then drawn a cartoon of a flower under his signature before we left the store. By the mid-80s, I was working at a different bookstore in St. Mark's Place. I had a buzz cut, wore a black leather jacket. Ginsburg's collected poems had just been published in an expensive hardcover edition, and we were doing a brisk business with a red dusk jacketed item. The store's owner gave me Ginsburg's phone number and told me to call him and ask him to stop by and sign copies of his book. Books signed by their authors usually sell faster than unsigned ones. They're simply more valuable. I said, okay. When I had a spare moment, I dialed the number. Ginsburg answered. That was my first surprise. I'd expected an answering machine or some kind of intermediary. Hi, Mr. Ginsburg. I said, is there any chance you could come by the bookstore and sign copies of your new book? Sure, he said, but only if you can tell me exactly how many copies have sold. I don't know, I answered truthfully, somewhat taken aback. Well, you'd better find out, he said, if you want to see me any time in the near future. Just a minute, I'll ask the boss, I said in a panic, knowing I'd be in deep shit if I fucked this up. <laughs> the guy I worked for really got off in thinking he was respected by the local literary heavyweights. If Ginsburg didn't show up, it would be such a blow to his ego, he'd have me sweeping the floors and dusting the shelves for the rest of my shift. Put my hand over the receiver and asked the other clerks if anyone knew exactly how many copies of Ginsburg's collected works we'd already sold. Nobody had a clue. Took my hand off the receiver and said, 50, great, he said, I'll be right over. <laughs> Hope Springs Eternal are the reincarnation of Andy Warhol's soul. There's a slight disturbance among the potato chips in a pink Tupperware bowl sitting on a wooden picnic table. None of the Baptists at the family reunion in Fort Wayne, Indiana notice. Now this particular disturbance is not man-made, nor is it an act of nature. It is, in fact, the awakening of Andy Warhol's reincarnated soul. What the hell, Andy thinks? A potato chip? Ice silk screen Monroe for this? The guys in the factory practically assured me I'd come back as the hippest thing possible, but a potato chip? It's nitpicking in the extreme, but we should note that Andy Warhol returned as a Pringle, not as a real potato chip, a detail that would have delighted him in his previous incarnation. <laughs> The afternoon wears on, and one by one his companions disappear. Lou, Holly, Baby Jane, Diva, and yes, even little Edie, until Andy is the only chip remaining. Please let me come back as a roll of aluminum foil next time, he prays, as the shadow of a large, callous Baptist hand blots out the sky above. <laughs> Fate conspires a perfect joke. I was walking across 57th Street on my way to work when I noticed him up ahead, scuffling along the curb, silver hair, blue jacket, and white sneakers. Probably wouldn't have given him a second thought, but he reminded me of someone I knew from the literary scene. As I pulled even, I realized I'd been mistaken. His hair was dirty yellow, unwashed, and one look at his shoes clinched it, worn out sneakers whispering, street, street. The guy was probably homeless, fucked up world, I thought, and swung into the front door of the bookstore. Later, I met Jim Feast for dinner at a neighborhood deli. We were in the middle of fixing up a manuscript, and a give and take had been a lot of fun. We bought sandwiches and coffees and headed for a back booth. And then I saw him again, sitting at a small table, head cradled in his arms, zonked down. A large coke teeter precariously near his elbow, and sure enough, the next thing you know, he knocked it to the floor with a reddish-brown liquid puddle like blood. 
Poor fucker, I thought. And then poor fuckers for the counter guys who were going to have to mop up the mess. So Jim and I got down to business, ripping out words and telescoping paragraphs, speeding a piece of writing into shape. And then from out of nowhere, like a state trooper screaming through your car window when you're pumping away in the back seat, he's in our face yelling us to buy me a sandwich, buy me a drink, give me money, heal my wounds, slinging spittle on my fucking glasses. Jesus, I say to the dude, I'm trying to have a conversation here, get a hold of yourself, but he's cursing and windmilling his arms in every direction like a helicopter going down. Back off, I shout at him, but it's like I'm not really there. And then I get a thought, a truly inspired, stupid thought. A thought I've carried around like a tattered knapsack. That is my brain for oh so long. You see, I kind of look like a Vietnam vet. I've got long, stringy hair and a gray mustache. I'm certainly old enough to have gone, though I didn't because I didn't want to kill anyone then to Vietnam. Anyway, I figured if some young buck jumped me some dark night, I'd have flipped out non-style and rant that I'd off tons of geeks, and I'd do him too. But I'd never had to go there till now, so I shout, I fucking kill guys in Nam and cut their ears off and strung them on a necklace, so get the fuck out of my face. Whoa. And the dude stops dead still, rolls up a sleeve, exposing a bony arm, Auschwitz thin with a tattoo of some kind of parachute device on it, and says, brother, I was there too, 82nd Airborne, you? <laughs> uh, and I'm floored once again by how the heavens work and how big an asshole I am. <laughs> And I'm wondering, what the fuck am I going to say to this fella? But it's all moot. The dude wanders back to his table and passes out again. The drama's over, and I'm left with an indefinite period of time in which to appreciate the great playwright's amazing <laughs> sense of humor. Great story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to read... Okay, I'm going to try this. If it fucks up, I'm sorry. This is called Finnegan Joyce. Oh, this is stupid. Hello, hello. James Joyce here, but briefly, yes, the voice. Yes, I know it doesn't sound so very good. No, the voice does not fare well here in the dead zone. Oh, when I used to be a tenor, such a beautiful tenor that they told me more than once that, yes, I could have been a contender, but don't take my word for it. Listen to the record. Do they still have records? It was a Finnegan's Wake rap sort of thing. Yes, as you can see, I try to keep up. Should have used more bass, a little sampling. Be okay on the boombox then, but I'm pulling your leg as if a shade could pull anything. Because now that I'm dead, I don't have to protect the image I worked so hard to create. I'm finally free, I tell you, though I still rejoice at the number of academics who toil in its shadow, who till the field I manured so well. The me they think they know is a construct. Only part of the story, James Joyce is Jesuit. James Joyce is steep, going slowly blind, grinding out the great creations in the face of insurmountable odds, misunderstanding, penury, censorship, the lovely chains of Ireland past and always present, but shit, what else could I do? I was as trapped by the iron logic of my own work as any Joycean scholar. Forget modernism. The better that bound me and yes, broke me was the notion of progress. I started small, a few poems that moved on to short stories, well crafted they were too, and finally graduated with my portrait to the novel. All well and good, we were on an upward moving line on the graph of life, steadily ascending and seeing the sense and shape of my literary output. I made the big jump, the quantum leap to Ur novel, the novel is encyclopedia, and the result was, of course, Ulysses. But that particular jump from the novel we all know and love to the thinner atmosphere of great book is a tricky one, because where do you go from there? The answer, as I gradually came to realize, was to pen scripture to convince myself and others that I was no longer a mere mortal fooling around with the same words we all have access to, but in fact, that I was engaged in a sacred quest, the creation of Holy Writ, an incredibly dense, almost unreadable compendium of everything known, the only book the ideal reader would ever need, and I also came to the realization that after I finished this thing, I would have to die. <laughs> It's not like I could break out of the path I was on and do a cookbook, for Christ's sake. <laughs> so I took as long as I could to write and rewrite, to code and encode my mad Bible. 17 years, and while I was doing this, other stuff kept happening. Life doesn't stop, and the real me kept seeping out, and I tried so hard to keep that stuff off to the side. But it's all there anyway, impossible to hide. Thank God the scholars mostly ignore real life. My poor mad daughter, Lucia, wanting to date that hanger-on, sad Sam Beckett, put a stop to that. And after dinner, when our guests sat at the table, wanting to wring me dry, searching for clues to the meaning of my work, I blew their minds instead. 
Yes, I'd jump up and perform strange terpsichorean feats. Yes, I'd pop my right leg up behind my head and grasp the foot with my left hand and hop wildly about. It's all true. <laughs> and yes, then I'd scissor kick all over the fucking place. <laughs> Mentally trying to knock the smug smiles off their faces because they were all a bunch of assholes. And yes, speaking of assholes, I'm going to recite for memory because there isn't much else to do after you die except memorize a letter I wrote to my wife, Nora, while we were briefly separated in 1909 because it pleases me to do so. This is a, true, this is a letter he wrote. You can find the selected letters. My sweet little whorish Nora, I did as you told me, you dirty little girl, and pulled myself off twice when I read your letter. I am delighted to see that you do like being fucked our ways. <laughs> Yes, now I can remember that night when I fucked you for so long backwards. It was the dirtiest fucking I ever gave you, darling. My prick was stuck up in you for hours, fucking in and out under your upturned rump. I felt your fat, sweaty buttocks under my belly and saw your flushed face and mad eyes. At every fuck I gave you, your shameless tongue came bursting out through your lips. And if I gave you a bigger, stronger fuck than usual, fat, dirty farts came spluttering out of your backside. You had an arse full of farts that night, darling, and I fucked them out of you. Big fat fellows, long windy ones, quick little merry cracks, and a lot of tiny little naughty farties ending in a long gush from your hole. It is wonderful to fuck a farting woman when every fuck drives one out of her. I think I would know Nora's fart anywhere. I think I could pick hers out, pick hers out in a room full of farting women. Good night, my little farting Nora, my dirty little fuck bird. And good night to you all. Good night, good night. That's actually in the selected letters, the paperback. It's not in the three-volume hardcover. You and Big Mike are brothers letter. now. That's it. Brothers? He's my fucking son. No, shut up. <laughs> Two minutes, I'll try this one. I think it works. The Collector. I'm a collector. I hunt down runs of literary magazines and signed first editions and place them in university literary archives. I collect comic books and the Jokers from decks of playing cards. I also lust after die-cast model cars, mostly Hot Wheels. I have hundreds of them, maybe thousands, some on display, but most of them stashed away in boxes. As I've gotten older, it's become more difficult to compete with younger Hot Wheels collectors. <laughs> so sad. I'm sorry. They line up outside the doors at Toys R Us, and as the store opens, they shove the mothers with their kids aside so they can race to see if can get to the pegs first. I usually come in last. So in order to get the newest releases, I've had to hook up with a dealer. <laughs> A guy who spends most of his waking hours tracking down products, some for himself, some to list on eBay, the rest for schmucks like myself. <laughs> My dealer's name is Ken, and he's a prison guard who works a night shift at Rikers, which, mean, which means he just barely makes it to the store before it opens. But he's buff, so no one fucks with him. He always gets to the Hot Wheels display rack first without having to hustle. The other collectors part like the Red Sea when he walks by. <laughs> Anyway, I took the day off from work and made plans to meet him on a Toys R Us parking lot in Long Island City on the morning of September 11, 2001. My wife and I sent our two sons off to school and then walked across Northern Boulevard towards the store. His car was parked pretty far away from the entrance, even though the lot was mostly empty. We noticed as we approached, we noticed as we approached that his car doors were open and his car was surrounded by several young girls all wearing red t-shirts who seemed to be listening to his car radio which was turned up real loud. And then we saw in the distance a plume of smoke rising into the sky from the city's skyline, more specifically from one of the World Trade Center towers. It seems to have been hit by a small plane, Ken told us when he got to his car. Man, New York City firemen are the best, I enthused. They're probably inside putting it out right now. Moments later, a manager came charging out of the store, shouting, I don't give a fuck what's going on. If you don't get your asses inside and punch in, I'll fire all of you, which quickly dispersed the crowd. I looked back at the skyline, one of the towers had disappeared, and the smoke was now pouring out of what used to be its twin. When we heard on the radio that planes were flying into things, my wife left to get our youngest son while I flagged down a car service to Astoria to collect our oldest. Thank you.